Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review, or I should say board games. Today we're going to be covering three games by Buttonshy Games. The first is Skulls of Sedlik by Mark Dobson. Uh, he made Battlecrest. We'll cover Food Chain Island by Scott Elms, the creator of many tiny epic games. And Tussie Mussy by Elizabeth Hargrave, who did Wingspan. We'll cover each one of these guys individually and talk about them and maybe uh, decide which ones you want to pick up. These are all 18 card card games. They're all made by Button Shy and they make small portable card games that you can play between the player count of one to four players. And most of their games are usually range in the two to three player count. Um, Skulls of Sedlik is going to be a graveyard game where you're gathering certain ancient people from the past and then creating your kind of own burial site and scoring points based on how you place them. In a two player game it'll be different than a three player game as far as how you construct the sites but they all have rules as to how they are placed. In Tessie Mussy you're playing the, ca the, the casual kind of straightforward choose to pick one in which you're gathering flowers to create a bouquet for your keepsakes and for your bouquet set trying to score the most points for each of the three rounds. In Food Chain Island by Scott Elms, this is a solo game that is basically played on an island. You're going to have different animals and those animals will eat each other. And your objective is to score as many points as possible by having animals eat as many people, eat as many animals as possible. And having the one lone animal left on the island if possible. Each of these games has unique little variants and I'll cover them in a little bit of detail each. And we'll start with Skulls of Sedlik, then we'll move on to Food Chain Island and finally Tussie Mussie and I'll give you a brief review. Okay, so this video is gonna be a little different as far as how the setup goes, but I'll explain the setup of the game. I will explain how it is played. I will then move on to the next game. I'll give a brief setup and explain how it's played and then Tussie Mussie. We'll just go from there. I think that'll be quicker. It'll be easier. So Skulls of Sedlek is basically the Black Plague and Hussite Wars have overcrowded the graveyard and helped the Bone Collector and a half-blind monk by exhuming graves and arranging the skulls inside the crypt. And each of the skulls has specific requirements. To start off, you're going to make a grid, a two by three grid with three cards each, and then you're going to place one of the cards on top of one of the piles face up. Depending on if you're playing a two or a three player game, you are going to be having a certain stack of your graveyard. It could be a four and then a three and then a two for a two player game, or it could be a three, two and a one for your four player game. But it works like this. There are three specific actions in the game. You're going to have dig, collect and stack. To dig, you'll flip over two cards that are face down or up to two cards and you'll select one of those that you flipped over and then you'll put it in your hand. Uh, to collect is you're simply going to take one of the cards that is already face up and then to stack you're going to take one of the cards in your hand and place it in your tableau. You can only have two cards max in your hand so on my turn if I wanted I could collect this guy here. I could instead take two cards flip them over for my dig action or I could place a card from my hand. Now in this instance I went ahead and flipped over two which is a dig and I'll go ahead and take this one here and put it in my hand. And the next player would get a chance to go and they would do the same thing. They would go ahead and uh, flip over two or collect one or place one from their hand. In this case, they'll just go ahead and take this one here. Then after they have done that, I've got my card in hand and I can once again choose to place this card or gather another card. Once I have two cards, that's it. So I think I'll go ahead and dig again. And there's a limited supply of resources here that you can gather. Basically, once these are all empty, that will trigger the end of the game. So I dig these two and I'll choose this one over here. And the next player, once again, go ahead and say, select this one here. Now I've got cards in hand. I can no longer dig, I can no longer collect, so my only option is to place, which I could have done earlier. And I go ahead and place this guy at the bottom of my rows. Uh, once I've placed this guy, it's set there forever. Now, like I said, we'll, we'll just do an example of a three, a four, four player game. So in this case here, my grid at the end of the game is gonna look something like this. And now that you know the actions and you understand how the game is played, this is the end game right here. And in the end game, you're going to check to see how well you did because each of these different colored skulls has point variations. The peasants, which are yellow, score you a point. The priests, which are blue, are going to score you two points, but only for each level. So when you have two priests in the same level, only one of them will score. Royals will score points based on any royals and peasants under it on the stack here. The criminals will score points, but only if they are adjacent to a priest and in this case only this one is so these guys would score me nothing and then we have the lovers lovers have to be paired and they can only be paired together so you couldn't have three lovers together uh, but you could have two and two or two two and two and they score three points a piece you'll score all of your total combined area 
and whoever has the most points at the end of the game is the winner. And that's based on all of these getting removed and you guys creating your three by two by one or in a two player game, your four by three by two. A pretty simple, straightforward game, which is Skulls of Sedlik. The next game we have here is Food Chain Island by Scott Elms. This is a single player game with a complex variation upon difficulty that you can select. In the game, you're making a 4x4 grid of all of the cards involved, except for the two water cards, which are set aside face up. You're always going to shuffle these cards, and each game is going to be different based on where the cards are presented in your 4x4 grid. Once you have your grid and your two cards set aside, you're basically ready to go. And on your turn, you're just going to be taking an action, and then you'll take another action, and you'll keep going until you can no longer take actions, and you'll see how you score. Taking an action is simple. You will select one animal to eat an adjacent animal, up, down, left, or right. And in order to eat an animal, that animal must be up to three numbers below the animal you're choosing to eat it with. So if I wanted to use my three, my three can only eat a two, a one, or a zero. You cannot eat a four, because that's too high. If I had my five, my five would only eat a four, a three, or two. It can't eat a one, because it's too low. And it can't eat a six, because it's too high. This is like the food chain on the island, as presented by these characters, which each have their own little pieces of artwork to illustrate what type of animals these animals will eat. On your turn, I would, you would select one of these animals and move it up, down, left, or right, covering up an animal or an insect or some type of creature or organism that can be eaten. When you take the action of moving an animal onto another animal, it creates a stack. And this stack will stay with the top animal being the only animal that matters. The other cool thing about this game too is each animal has an action. And in order to pr pr presume or continue your next action, you must, pr you must do whatever the animal says. So when the mouse eats the plant, that means I have to move one animal one to two spaces. And you can move any animal that you'd like before you continue eating. So in this case here, if I want it, I can move my lynx one and two spaces. And because the 4x4 grid is not contained, you can move animals outside of the grid. After I've done whatever the animal says, regardless of whether I like to do it or not, I can then presume to continue to play the game. And I would then likely select another animal to eat an adjacent animal and take the action. Move one animal up to two, uh, move an one animal two spaces. So I could go ahead and move this guy one and two. And I'm done with that, so I can continue eating. So I could choose to have this animal eat this animal and swap the locations of two animals. So I could then swap these guys here. And you're just gonna keep going like that. And your objective is to create just one stack of animals, which is actually very challenging because each animal has their own unique abilities. Luckily for you, you have these little water cards, the whale and the shark. At any point on your turn, you can flip these guys over and use their abilities. The shark will let you flip it over, move an animal one space, and then it must eat. And the whale will just simply let you move any one animal to any other location. When you use the animal's abilities, like I said, make sure they're flipped over. You cannot use them again for the remainder of the game. And the other cool thing about this game, too, is there are variations. If you want to make the game a little bit more complex, you can either A, remove these water cards, or B, change the style of the grid. And there is a variation on ways you can do that, by creating a 4 by 3 and then adding 2 to each side in the very bottom, or by making an 8, etc., etc. But yeah, it's a solo game. You can play it cooperatively, cooperatively together and choose how you want to utilize the cards and how you want to move the animals. But in general, this is a solo game all about trying to create one stack of animals that have met the food chain requirements. The next game we have on the table is Tussie Mussie by Elizabeth Hargrave. This is a game that plays up to four players, I believe. And it is going to take about 30 minutes because this is a game that actually has rounds to it. And the way this works is one of those games where you may or may not have heard of this type of a game, but it's called an I pick and you choose. You'll take your deck of cards, you'll shuffle your deck of cards, and then you're gonna have one player begin the game. That player will pick two cards and select one to go face up and one to go face down. And the other player is then going to choose one of these. They can choose the face down card or they can choose the face up one. Face up ones are in your bouquet face down are in your keepsakes, which actually makes a difference as to how scoring goes. So in this case, the player can choose this and the other player is going to get the other card. And this will then pass to the next player. And the next player will take two, uh, look at those two, and then once again, choose a face up one and a face down one. And now the next player will get a chance to choose. Do I want the face up or the face down? And you can select either or. You'll be placing cards from left to right and you'll be connecting them. And once a player, or all players, I should say, have four cards, and we'll just go ahead and say it looks something like this, 
that will be the end of the round. Any cards that are face down are going to move down on your little grid here or on your row. They'll move down. These are called your keepsakes. And all the cards that are face up are your bouquet and will stay face up and a little higher than your keepsakes. Each player will flip over the cards that they have face down and scoring will begin. Some cards before scoring can begin have little actions or operations that you can take and you can do those beforehand. Your objective is to score as many points in the round as possible. Each card is going to give you hearts and points. Hearts are basically considered points and you'll be adding them up with the bonuses. So like plus three points if none of your cards have hearts. In this case, I have a card that has a heart, so zero points. This card is any color and one point because it has a heart on it, so one point. And I would tally up all my points here. Some cards involve having cards in your bouquet or having them in your keepsakes. But once you have tracked your points, you'll write it down somewhere. You'll take all the cards shuffle the deck, and once again, play the game. And after the end of three rounds, you will score. You will see who has the most points based on all three cumulative rounds of play, and that player is the winner of the game. It's a pretty simple I pick you choose style game, but it has a lot of heart and a lot of beauty in it as well. So there you go. There are three button shy games that you can choose from with some pretty prominent designers and unique styles of games. An I pick you choose game, a solo player game involving a little bit of solitaire as well as choices and strategy and moving on a grid. And then you have Skulls of Sedlik, which is kind of a, uh, it's an action management. It's like, I guess, a tableau placement or tile placement type of a game utilizing cards, forming on a grid to score as many points as possible, and trying to kind of puzzle your way into scoring the correct points by placing down the skulls in the correct locations of your own personal cemetery. These are all very unique games. A single player game. This one plays, I believe, up to four. Yes, this is like I kept saying, I believe up to four. I've only played these all two players, me and my wife. And I played the skulls of Sedlec, but this one can play up to three players. So you have have a different variation on different games. Now, I'm not going to rank these guys like this is the better one. I can tell you which one I like the best. I prefer Skulls of Sedlec. That's my personal preference. But these games are just very, very different. They all function the same way, though. They're all small games with beautiful artwork. They go in your pocket and you can travel and play them anywhere. It just depends on the type of game you want to play and at what time. So as far as my review goes, I'm just going to kind of rate these guys as how, as how they kind of look and feel and everything. Tussie Mussy, first of all, is beautiful. The artwork is great. Um, this game is really straightforward, really simple to play. It's easy to understand the difference between a keepsake and a bouquet, the different colors and the range of values, scoring points. Some cards are a little better than other cards, and I do terribly at this game. So when I play this game with my wife, I generally lose. I did win last night though, however, so that was good. Maybe it made me like the game a little bit more, but in general, I'm just not very good at these games. I'm, I'm, I'm like nervous as to what you have to choose, what you pick. The, the interesting aspect to me in this game is there's a card face down and one face up. And what card does my opponent want me to take? Is it the obvious choice or is it the face down one? Or do they want that one? What do they have on the field? What have I given them? And what do I know that I've given them? And what do I need the most? How can I balance out so I make the most points? And it has a lot of that value in there for only 18 cards. And the fact that you can play up to four players is awesome. It's a small game, compact, fits anywhere, and is a beautiful little play style of something that if you haven't played a I Pick You Choose game, this is one to definitely pick up because it's a good price point and it's easy to play and you can play it anywhere. Food Chain Island. Now, typically I'm not a very big solitaire fan, but this game is so compact, portable, and easy to bring out, and it's a quick play. It has a different variation on the different plays that you can choose just on the back. It tells you the different ways and you can play the game. It has a little added complexity of the different type of animals that you can utilize, and there's so much that you can compound on this game if you want. You can make expansions and whatnot. It just does a really good job. It fits very well. Now, of course, each of the different combinations will be more difficult or easier, depending on just how it plays out. So there is a little bit of luck involved in like what you get as far as when all the cards are placed face down. If every card flips over and it's in this perfect, phenomenal, you know, set of coincidences, you know, like it's going to work great for you. But when you get some nasty boards and whatnot, it becomes a little more frustrating, but thinky. And in my opinion, that's even better because you have to challenge yourself to get the best possible score you can with the worst possible scenario. It does a very good job for those of you who are solitaire gamers who want something quick and simple and easy to play and have a little bit more thinky to it, thinkiness to it than you would actually expect. And all the art 
is great. This is my favorite art from all of these games, just because I love the fact that each of these little animals are eating kind of another animal, or like debating to eat another animal, in their food chain. Like the bat has a rat inside of a hot dog. Oh, it's that's amazing. The polar bear is kind of preparing to eat the tiger, and the lynx has got the fox, and the snake has got the bat, and the rat's got the lizard, and the mouse has got the uh, insect, and then you got a plant. The plant's just kind of hanging out and doesn't eat anybody. But the artwork's great, the theming is great as well. Then we have the Skulls of Sedlik. Now uh, this game's pretty safe, straightforward as far as art goes. It's just got skulls with color with a little bit of variation to understand the differences between them. You understand what they're, you're doing in the game and you understand how you need to create the process. This has got actually quite a bit of thinkiness to it as well. The fact that you have different options as to how you take things, what your opponent is going to take, and all of that makes a huge difference. Even one card can make the difference between you losing and winning this game, which has got a lot of value for a super small card game. And the fact that you can play it at either two or three players is nice as well. I really enjoyed the idea of stacking my cards, doing the best I possibly could do, and watching my opponents to see not what they really wanted, but they were, what they were going to take away from me. And that presented with a unique little challenge. And there's quite a bit of thinkiness and time invested in this game as far as what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do things. And it just worked out really well. I just really enjoyed it. The theme's kind of cool too, the idea of like the hierarchy of the dead and in which ways you kind of want to place your certain cards. It just, it just really worked for me. And I really enjoyed it. So those are the three different options for you to go ahead and choose from. None of these games are bad. They're all really good in their own right. And they're all very different. So it's hard to rate them specifically as to which is the better game or whatever. There was no issues I really had with any of the games. Obviously, most of my reasoning is just how good I am at games. I'm terrible at games like these. These ones here I don't generally play. And these ones are very familiar with, so I really enjoy games like these. But overall, I had a lot of fun with all three of these, and I did a live stream where you can watch me play all three of these games with my wife. And in fact, I actually won both of these games, surprisingly, because I almost never win games like these against my wife. So if you're interested, check those out. But yes, if you want, you can go ahead and pick up any of these guys and link in the description. I had a ton of fun and a positive experience with all of them. But I'm guessing one of them stands out to you. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. If you're interested in picking up any one of these three games or a multitude of other games in their catalog, I highly suggest you go ahead and take a look at their website. I'll also be doing a few other videos with them because uh, I've got a full set of Agropolis and Metropolis and, uh, and all these other little cool bonus games. And I'll have another review coming shortly but because I played these recently and I really enjoyed them. I want to do it while it's fresh in my head and I just had a lot of fun with these. Our live streams are every Sunday and every Wednesday. Wednesday is our whatnot and Sunday is our Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, where I literally play games just like these. And you can watch us on either platform at 6.30 p.m. PST. If you think we've earned your subscription, if you watched more than one of our videos here on Whatnot, or on Unfiltered Gamer, then I do suggest you go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It does greatly help us out. We greatly appreciate it. And it feels like we're doing something that's worthwhile, that you'll enjoy, that we make content, that you can go ahead and see new games that come out that you may not have seen before. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I will enjoy making a beautiful flower arrangement, eating up all the animals on the island, or contracting the dead to have their own hierarchy system with you next time. <laughs>